direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access. It's Foxborough Central, and here's your host, Bob Hickey. Welcome to another great episode of Foxborough Central. That's right, you heard the man. I'm Bob Hickey, your host. Thank you for taking the time. Grab a cup of coffee. Sit on back. Meet with me and my guest. My guest for today is Jim Timothy, Senator James Timothy, who represents Foxborough as well as some other towns. Walpole, Mansfield, Norton, Attleboro, Rehoboth, Seekonk, Medfield, and uh, three precincts in Sharon. Wow. Busy, busy, busy. But yeah. of course, we're here in Foxborough on Foxborough Cable Access. And thank you for taking the time to come in and spend a half hour with us talking about all the things that are exciting up on Beacon Hill. Yeah. And things are exciting up there, right? Yes, it, it, it's a very interesting time. Uh, certainly the beginning of any legislative session uh, brings all new, all kinds of new challenges and, and, and hopefully new opportunities. And this one maybe will be even more interesting in that uh, in the governor's budget he has proposed um, a myriad of, of different proposals and what he calls a way forward. And that way forward comes with uh, a certain price tag. So myself and uh, the rest of the members of the Senate and the members of the House are in our job of deliberating over that, uh, the general appropriation as we call it, the state budget, which is about $32 billion, and going over the ways that he sees Massachusetts going forward. And I'm certain that uh, all of us, myself included, will have some comments and some discussions and some agreements and maybe some disagreements in, on, on the way he would like to continue government uh, going forward. So, and this taping, depending on when you're watching at home, is in the early spring, late winter, early mm -hmm. spring. With all the snow we just had, I'll have to go with late winter, but uh, technically it's early spring of 2013. So we're talking about the fiscal year 2014 budget. Correct. And, and Governor Patrick has uh, submitted a budget to the Senate for review and yes. amendment. Is that how it works? Well, what it, what it is, he, he proposes a budget. This is the way he would like to see um, as, as the executive in the, uh, in, the, in the state. He would like to see us uh, proceed in the way we uh, put forward. And then the timing of which is late January, early February, the governor office is either House 1 or House 2 uh, budget to uh, the, the legislature. And then in April, the House builds its own budget. They okay. build their budget and they say, well, this is the way we go about it. And then in late May, the Senate does the same thing. And then in the month of June, there is what we call a conference committee, which is uh, three members of the House, three members of the Senate get in a room and uh, go over every single line item backwards and forwards. And then uh, hopefully on maybe June 30th, July 1st, the start of our fiscal year, uh, we come together. There's a conference committee report. There's an up and down vote over that. And we submit it to the governor, in which case he takes a look at it and determines what he likes in it and what he doesn't, and then he would veto any matter that uh, that was uh, that he particularly didn't agree with. So and it's that's called the line item veto. Line item veto. Okay. And that's that's the thing. The governor is the executive, but we are the legislative. We are essentially town meeting. It's it's our job uh, to, uh, to to craft the budget, and then he is the executive. He administers it. So it's a it's an it's an interesting conversation uh, between us. It takes some time, but when you're talking about 32. Uh, billion dollars and you know it, its effect on sounds like a lot it's it's a significant a significant amount I mean if you, if you take a look at it um, we have a 32 billion dollar budget or thereabouts the state of Indiana has a 32 billion dollar budget for two years so they build their budget for two years and they have the same amount of people a little bit a uh, little bit difference in size but Indiana has uh, has about the same population but it has half the budget of, hmm. of Massachusetts, and I think that uh, that's indicative. I think we're we're in a, in a better position in some respects, certainly uh, in education, and a, a bulk of our non-discretionary or discretionary uh, money that we can spend goes to education, both K through 12 and higher education. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, with a with a leader, frankly, in this country, and I think with a leader in put us put us right at the top in the world. Interesting, interesting. So, with this budget, thirty-two billion, the, I mean, the immediate uh, thought is, well, okay, so we've got enough money to fund everything, right? But we've had some stresses these last few years, and even this year, there was discussion about tax revenue being down, uh, and and also an increase in certain programs. Uh, so, you talk about discretionary funding. Is this budget 
more equal to, <laughs> I would never think less than, uh, last year's budget? Well, it, it's, the, the governor's proposal would go up 7% which right, right away uh, causes me... 7%. 7%. You know, and 7% on $32 billion is... And the current rate around. of inflation is significantly less than that. I, with, without a doubt, I think our, our consensus revenue figures would probably have us have the budget, have, have our gross domestic product, or whatever you would want to call it, whatever the economic term mm -hmm. is, would probably have gone up about you know, 2%, mm. 3%. So right away, that causes me uh, to, to pause and say I, I, it doesn't appear that we're you know in that type of uh, of state in the, in, the, in that in the state financially i don't think that we're at in a position where we can go up seven percent and he does that by lowering the sales tax but by raising uh the income tax and he's also looking to find ways to pay for some massive expansion uh in the uh, metro uh, in the MBTA mm -hmm. in the in the train service and I and I think and it's always been my discussion at least over the last three or four years particularly with the proposal to bring a train to um, to Patriot Place, Patriot Place yep. on a daily basis which would have been had to, would had to be run at a ten million dollar operating loss and when you take a look at the T and you drill down on the T and you realize that that is an agency that spends thirty percent of its operating budget on debt service now my sense is that you know, we have some transportation problems, whether it be our roads and bridges, and, you know, and there is certainly some need to pay attention to that because the big dig took a lot of money away from local road projects. But in doing so, why would you, until and unless you can take care of your house, why would mm -hmm. you look to expand? If you had a leaky roof, you wouldn't put an addition on. And he's, uh, the governor has proposed bringing a train to Fall River in New Bedford, which would be, that has a $2 billion price tag. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also moving the Green Line up to Somerville, which has another $2 billion price tag. So he's offered some, some, some proposals that would raise taxes to the tune, I think, of over, over time, uh, maybe $4 billion, but he's proposed $5 billion worth of expansion. So that's the one, that's the one thing that I can't um, agree with. And not to suggest that the role of the T is about transportation and thinking long term. You have to have people who are transportation planners, mm -hmm. but until and unless you can pay for that, they have to have a fiduciary responsibility to the next generation because if we're wrestling with this big dig debt which we are and, and people talk although I have a problem because any debt whether it be transportation whether it be for higher ed or any bond that we've done is state debt it's you know the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth is behind right. that and sometimes they put them in silos and they and they use them if we're dealing with big dig debt as has been told by a myriad of people from the uh, from the transportation agencies why would we be looking to expand well, you know, and that's a, a, a great start, and I wish we had more than a half hour for this program because I love talking about the T, uh, fantastic service, but the debt load that was created, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but created in large part due to an allocation of debt from the big dig was right. placed on the back of the T, which didn't necessarily have that debt in the first place, but it was, and again, artificially is the wrong word because when you're budget planning, you, you allocate to what the service sector is going to be responsible mm -hmm. for. But how did that debt get on the T in the first place? Certainly the red line didn't go out and buy 19 new cars they couldn't nope. afford. How did that debt get there? Well, it's, it's, it, they created what is called the Department of, Mass Department of Transportation. And that's what it's one big super agency. It was designed to bring some... Um, Put everything together and bring some efficiencies, and not have not have uh, some managers. I get I get very concerned about any any when you make big agencies bigger, they become even more dysfunctional. And a great example would be the Turnpike Authority working parallel to Mass Highway uh, when they're essentially doing the same, thing, the same thing. But you have a revenue stream, but then that revenue stream, and again, this is just my nickel analysis. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but that revenue stream created the bureaucracy that then caused the revenue stream to have to be increased. Yeah. So by eliminating that whole bureaucracy and the support services and combining them with another agency, you ideally strengthen the agency by, by eliminating duplication? That's the idea. But as I have always said, it, it's, you, when you make these, it, it just creates larger dysfunction. <laughs> and, and, and sadly, until I can be proved incorrect, uh, and as I say, when you're spending 30% of your operating budget on debt service, you've got to you've you've got to slow down. Mm -hmm. You can't grow. Don't grow that. Don't grow that pie. Don't. This big dig debt is so onerous that we haven't dealt with for almost a generation now. If it was created in the mid, you know, mid to late 90s, 
if now you're just kicking the can down the road. And if you take a look at some of the lessons we learned in the Greenbush train, Greenbush train doesn't have the ridership that they anticipated. So it's it in, in and of itself it was a great exercise. It was designed to get people off Route 3, which I guess in the morning is a disaster yes. trying to commute. But it hasn't solved that problem, and there are very few people uh, comparatively so on that train. And my suggestion would be st stop what you're doing and fix the problems from the generations past. But they're moving moving forward and then moving forward at a very uh, in, a, in a very fast pace on this South Coast Rail and the Green Line expansion. And I think some of the lessons we learned from uh, the 90s, around the same time we had the transportation problem, was in the school building authority, where there were many promises by the state yes. to fund uh, school construction, and it was appropriate. However, they had got themselves, by the DOE running that program, they had got themselves into about a $6 billion problem. And what they did was they, they put the brakes on it, they put a moratorium in, and that was kind of painful, but it was necessary. They created uh, the Mass School Building Authority, mm -hmm. and they took a penny on the sales tax, and it went to school construction. And now that program is actually, that Mass School Building Authority is a model program. You, it would Anybody in the private sector, who I've, having spent some time in, as a manager in a, in a private sector company, you would look at how they operate. It would, it would bring you some, it would remind you of a way that a private sector company worked, and they are paying off early now. Attleboro and Norton, Norton High School is under construction right now, right. and they are paying off early, which is saving communities, millions around the Commonwealth, in debt service. And that is my thinking. I think that the T needs to run a little bit more like the school building authority. That's, that's really interesting because, it, I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a selectman here in Foxborough mm -hmm. back in the uh, early stages of my, of my time doing that. Uh, I remember uh, Tim Cahill coming in and talking about the school, uh, this new proposal for how to fund the school, uh, the state portion of school uh, reimbursement, and we were in line for reimbursement at the high school at the time, uh, needed to be um, not reconstructed, but remodeled. Uh, yeah. We had uh, certain rooms that were an ADA compliant, we had uh, labs that had issues, we had uh, you know, a myriad of problems, uh, windows that, that were not energy efficient and lo losing a lot. So. When that program was described to us before it was implemented and before we came up due on our and, and the cycle of when we were ready to be reimbursed, it was one of the things, well, we've been promised this, but now the program is gone. So 10 years down the road now, we see that not only is it successful, mm -hmm. but you're saying that it's now the model. And if the T were to do something like that, but is it possible? They've got so much debt. How could they possibly work their way out of this? And, and, and that's, that's the thing is it's, it's important for the state to realize, you know, as we say, is the difference between transportation planners and, and somebody who, can, who has, has the fiduciary responsibility about you can only do that what you can pay for. Mm -hmm. We've seen what, we, we have seen what has happened to other countries and, in, in, a, in a sense, to us nationally, where you continually deficit spend. It, at some point, it, the house comes down. Uh, you're seeing it in Greece, you're seeing it in, in Italy, it's happening mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, and it's, it's nice to live in a world where everything is perfect and we're going to help as many people and, and, and do as much as we can. But you can only do that which you can pay for. Uh, and, we, and as I said, that nationally, that's been, that should be a lesson to us. So my suggestion is, as wonderful as that would seem, and I understand that there are people in Fall River in New Bedford who would like to see that train happen uh, tomorrow. It's something that we can't handle because they have a $2 billion price tag, as we saw with the Big Dig. The Big Dig started off as a $2 billion project in the mid to late 80s. And then what did it end up being? Uh, it was, it's, it's, no, it was, uh, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, high 20s, high in the 20s, billion dollars. Okay. Yeah. And you, you did the largest public works job in the history of the country on a time and materials basis. That was a mistake back in the 80s and 90s. And we, this generation now, is, is paying for that. So my suggestion is that we just have a, have a more cautious and measured approach and that we deal with, with those problems. Because uh, nobody to this point has, has been able to tell me that, yeah, we have this big dig debt that was in the 90s that we haven't dealt with. Right. But we're expanding to the tune of $5 billion in two different parts of the Commonwealth. And there are even plans for Worcester to Springfield. There's many plans. I haven't been able to say, well, we're going to create more debt, even though we're we're struggling, and we've got to raise your fares 43 percent. They're talking about another T fare hike. At some point, you're going to put people, you're going to.
put the price of that. And you're going to price them to out. Right. They're going to price them out of the market. They're going to be able to use it. So the expansion is going to be underutilized because you're not going to be able to afford to use it. So then, that, where do you end up? Absolutely. And we've seen that. the The idea for the Green Bush train was that they would get about forty to fifty percent of ridership from an other other mass transportation, whether that was people who took the boat or people who took the red line. Mm -hmm. It really turned out to be sixty-seven percent. So the people it was just taking people from the from, red line from and moving them to the green bush. Sure, sure. And that 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 in and of itself, when you miss by that much, and uh, that, that had a that had a billion dollar price tag. I get a little concerned about what I call uh, it's it's public sector empire creating. It's some people get into these roles in in government, whether it be uh, through one of the quasi agencies, whether it be you know the Massport or somewhere else or the MBTA, and they uh, they create these new lines. It's like resume building. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know I'm the one who did the Greenbush line. I'm the one who did, and then they move on. You you see them. They leave state service and they go to a consulting firm, and it just it just I think you just literally have to slow it down, be more be more cautious and in, in view your approach, particularly now, I'm somebody who takes the train uh, from time to time. When the schedule allows to get myself off of uh, the expressway, mm -hmm. I'll take occasionally the 34E, which goes through Forest Hills, or I'll come right down to Mansfield and hop on the train. That's where I used to get on when I was working in Boston. Sure. It's, 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 a, it's a great way. You have your it's iPod. a great line, and it's, it's very well uh, utilized. The, the trains are standing room only sometimes. That's so the Mansfield line, uh, we'll call it the Providence line, yeah. is an example of a successful Yeah. Uh, oh, it absolutely line. works. And, and the problem with that success is that, you know, you, you pay the, you know, the, the fare of, you know, $9 each way, and you don't get a seat. You know, you see a standing from Mansfield all the way to Boston. I mean, from a customer service perspective, sure. I have some, as a customer of the T, sometimes I have some concerns about the way they deal with their, you know, their customers. When you, if Subway right up here had decided to, well, we, you know, we've got some problems from our expansion, so we're going to take our, you know, $6 foot long and we're going to change it to, uh, oh, it's going to now going to be a $10 foot long. They wouldn't stay in business for too long with that type. So when the T came up with an idea, and this is this is perfect. It was last winter the T had the idea to move the train to Foxborough at a ten million dollar operating loss. At the same time, they were saying, "Well, we have to raise fares by forty three percent because we have some problems with our big dig debt." Which, ironically, big dig debt is their expansions. That's the silver line. That's some of the mitigation when you add when you add some uh, there were some miles of road. Yeah, right. There were you, some mandated expansion that came along with that legislation. Yeah, the, the Greenway, the Greenway. Uh, you know, with with, with tax, taxpayers, uh, that's that park. It's a beautiful park mm -hmm. by the Federal Reserve, uh, right in the middle of Boston. It is beautiful. There are a lot of tourists there, and it is it's very attractive. However, we're spending uh, I don't know how much per acre to maintain that. It's and a lot more than you're spending up in the common. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'm sure, and some of the development plans that they had anticipated have now fallen through. I remember there was a, a, a good story in the Globe about what the anticipated development was going to be and what the truth is, and the yeah. truth was that nothing's really happened. No, nothing. And part of that is the economy. When went down 2008, 2009, a lot of, you're talking about government discretionary spending, well, a lot of nonprofit and corporation uh, Discretionary spending uh, just evaporated because when you have tough times, you want to hold on to what you have to mm. prepare for the rainy day, which doesn't <laughs> seem to work at the state level. No, but that's, <laughs> we're, we're trying to bring that 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 novel approach uh, from the private sector, and in, that's why many of us are very sector. happy that you're uh, representing us up on Beacon Hill. And 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 that's the thing. I, I I did have the opportunity from working in the private sector. I was working for a telecommunications company, and I worked there. And then I was a uh, purchasing and distribution manager. So I was buying, we were a very big, very big company, successful. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was we had the late 90s, which was a lot of uh, dot com companies were, sure. were expanding the technology, computers and phones were very hot. And then we had Y2K. And, you know, that was, everybody had to upgrade their system. So we, there was some, there was the seven years of wheat, as it were. And then in April of 2001, and then finally, sadly, with the uh, horrific attack of those murderous cowards yes. uh, on 9-11, you know, our, our business just stopped. And that company had to reinvent itself. And, and we did. And we, we shed about half the company. And we had to do things very differently and, 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 and manage. And, and it was literally for, for a few months we wondered, with a very big company, very secure, whether we were going to survive. And I think having had that experience and trying to bring a little of that 
into government. I'm not always I'm not always right, and that's why I try to make certain that I'm uh, out and about all mm -hmm. the time. I love to hear the feedback. Not every you know, I'm not going to be perfect. Which you know? again is why uh, we're very grateful that Senator Jim Timothy uh, is joining us today to sort of share with what's going on up on Beacon Hill and uh, and helping us understand what the current issues are. And you talked about the budget. And I, I love talking budget. And yeah. I, people at home, my apologies, but I love talking about budget. So I, it is what it is. With the budget that was submitted by Governor Patrick, the ball Patrick, a 7% increase, is he, uh, and, you know, this, this analogy comes up years ago, uh, the joke about the fire department was that if they wanted to get one new person, they'd ask for 10 and they'd settle on two. So is this the type of budget gamesmanship that's going on up there? Is it really that he doesn't want to increase government by 7%, he just wants to get his increases in and he figures, well, if I bang it up by seven, you cut me down to two, we'll somehow get around to three and a half. Is that what's going on? Or is this a legitimate 7% necessity to fund entitlements, uh, discretionary uh, program increases, new programs, that is going to be really tough to overcome? I'm just curious think, about the whole process. And I, and I wonder, because it's you know, the two different roles. I mean, he's the executive for the Commonwealth, so he sees you know, all, 350, you know, all 351 and all the different areas where you know, my role and in, 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 in I am... Uh, resolute in it is I have uh, nine communities I have a hundred sixty five thousand people and my job is to represent my little island my my part of mm -hmm. Massachusetts so I mean I would right right away I would say raising the budget seven percent uh, you know his, his way forward I mean maybe there's you know a certain legacy and maybe he said you know what I'm I'm in a position here where I think that you know that this is something uh, that we should do so I, I, I don't know necessarily his motives or what he would hope would be the end game but my job is to say, at least, is, I'm concerned about what is what is coming to to this part of the Commonwealth because, as, as you know, kid who was brought up in Boston, in Canton, you know, I've. And you were born around here. I'm I'm, I'm Mattapan, born in Mattapan, yeah. went to Boston Public Schools, and uh, my family moved to Canton. I went to BC High, uh, Boston College High School, and then uh, college in St. Louis. So, but I've been, you know, I've been around. But having seen this part of the area, a lot of people have moved out here, and, and everybody knows that, myself uh, in, included. Mm -hmm. um, in in the last, we, the dollars don't necessarily flow with the people. So I kind of wonder where, you know, I, I understand what he's what he's trying to do for the state as a whole. But I think this area has been underserved in terms of the dollars that it's flown. The Chapter 70 formula, uh, which is state aid to uh, mm -hmm. K through 12, isn't particularly great in certain communities, Norton uh, in particular, it always could be uh, a little better. Whereas, you know, what is happening in, in Lawrence, in Boston, Fall River, there is, you know, those, the resources flow uh, quite significantly uh, to those communities. So I think you're always, like we talk about budget, you're always talking about where that pie is, uh, is cut up in. And certainly in transportation, I, I don't think, I think we're, I think we're underserved. And then with that, uh, I think you had mentioned, um, and maybe you could elaborate on it, the, uh, some of the funding formulas that are being floated, maybe uh, as opposed to distance from the hub as to what you pay for your ticket or your monthly pass, it becomes more of a of, a, of, a, of an economic indicator stress test. It becomes more of a of a, you know what what your household median income is. I think yeah, you, you said. know you're right on. There are, there are proposals uh, to make it. Uh, it's a it's part of the way part of the way forward. But everybody a, pays their fair share. <laughs> it's uh, it would raise your your T fair would be based on median household income. So you would be, they would take this, they would take this wonderful area, you know, great suburban towns, uh, and you know, take a look at all of the homes. And in, instead of paying, you know, for the distance that you travel, mm -hmm. you would be paying a, a rate, um, which I think in this area would be significantly higher uh, if that proposal were to be adopted. Uh, it is, it's a Senate bill and a House bill, whereby you pay based on median household income, not how far you travel and how long. And it would be, I think it would be, a, it would be a sticker shock eye-opener uh, for many of, of, of our fellow uh, commuters uh, who take that train every day. And it's like the gas tax and T-fare hikes. At some point, you're going to price people out of being able to go to work. And that's uh, not only is it news to me, but also uh, I, I believe that with uh, the current budget of the budget that was passed last year, the uh, tax write-off for commuter rail passes is also being eliminated. And, uh, and uh, there's, there's, it's, it's several proposals that, um, 
with the new with the new if if the governor's budget were adopted, it would be it would be significant. It'd be a raise in the income tax uh, from we're at about 5.2 or 5.3 percent as it's uh, been phased down from uh, from 595 five, five, 585 five to five. We're at 52 or 53 somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, that would move to six percent, and then the sales tax would be dropped from six and a quarter to to five dollars. So he has it's in there's in there's several uh, write offs, student loans, uh, mortgage deductions. There are several write write offs that people you know have come to expect. Come, come to expect that would be eliminated. So it's a it's it's a it's a it's a bold move. And uh, you know as I, as I say, the governor you know sees all three fifty one, and he sees you know maybe legacy. Um, you know, I'm more, you know, each budget, you know, each season comes up and, you know, let's deal with what we can here and now and let's take our time and let's get the, let's get our transportation system in order because it was, it was th that massive project, the big dig that has, you know, has led our roads into the position uh, that they are. And with the, with the growth in population that's happened out here, that's when you need not, not just paying for what you used to have but that's new lights that's new intersections sure. you know that's there are there are several things and it, they were kind enough to send out a map of each senator's district I'm, I would imagine each one because I got one for its education spending and for its transportation spending wasn't a lot in this way forward that 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 this district was getting that we were getting there wasn't much tangible that I could say to the you know the 165,000 people that I represent yeah it's going to be painful we have to pay for this but this is what you get out of it and there hasn't there isn't a lot that you would be able to say uh, at the end of that shopping trip that this is what I have you know and this is a great discussion to have uh, particularly since you do represent Southern areas we in Foxborough have uh, I will say been blessed with uh, strong economic growth uh, particularly along Route 1 but also the stability of having uh, Invensys uh, here as a major employer, uh, as well as uh, maybe not suffering from a lot of the pains of unemployment. We have uh, uh, MedTech coming in MedTech to our industrial in. park. Yeah. So there's some significant businesses that are here, are growing, or are coming into the area that have offset uh, the significant three and a half year economic downturn. Mm -hmm. So we in Foxborough have been a little inured against it. And you know, perhaps to our uh, discredit, we don't really understand what's going on with the state budget relative to the local communities as far as reimbursed, as far as funding, as far as cherry sheet funding. And you know, it's great having you in here to talk about what really is going on. So what are your top concerns? Say Foxborough didn't have this growth, what would we be facing uh, from the state that you're perhaps dealing with in some of your other communities. Well, I, I think what what is you know Meditech coming here and and and, and Vences, you know being here and hopefully staying here. Uh, this is a great town. This is a great area of the Commonwealth, and you know that been that's because of the way your town governs itself. You know you have a you know a wonderful you know locally elected school committee, um, a very active parent teacher organization. Uh, the schools are are fantastic, and it's just kind of a, a you know as I as I say, I keep going back to you know a measured approach. You know, allow Foxborough to kind of to zone itself, to put in what it you know what it wants, mm -hmm. give it its self determination because this is an excellent town, and because it is an excellent town, people will continue to choose to live here. People continue to come here, and companies will. And you know, my my job is to kind of make certain that, or, or it, I view it as that the state has a hands off. Uh, lays a fair approach. We, it's it's an excellent community. You know, they built themselves. The job is not to discourage growth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't 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 get out of the way. In in many respects, and I think myself and, and Representative Barrows, uh, that's what we that's what we do. Is you know, our job is to kind of say in some, in some respects, you know, you say yes to the state, you say no to the state. Uh, and it's not about being afraid of like a tax or a fee. I authored a bill in two thousand eight, which uh, raised everybody's cell phone. Uh, bill uh, to the tune of about five dollars a year, but what that went to that created it's about twenty eight million dollars a year that goes back to state nine one one service. It was my bill. I think it was it was would have been viewed as one of the largest reforms of two thousand eight. It was a landmark reform of our state nine one one system. It eliminated the st uh, statewide emergency telecommunications mm -hmm. board and turned it into a state nine one one department in light of the new technologies, whether it's text or cell phones, and also engaged the disability community to come in 
and said, hey, look, I'm going to ask everybody for an additional $5 on top of what they're paying for their, uh, for their cell phone bill. But what that's going to do is that's going to save a life someday because we're going to have the best 911 system. And it also took a look at an archaic way of we have um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 230 or so PSAPs, public safety answering points. Mm -hmm. And the state of California has, I think, eight. New Hampshire has four. I mean, do we need to have 230? 30 some odd of these, or could we do a regional 911? And in doing so, can we, you know, can we take some old 911 systems that are out there and make them, you know, and, and make them better? Better hardware, better software, better training, better seats, better equipment, and in doing so, will that, that will lead to save a life. And if somebody has a disability, they're seven times more likely, I mean, that's the average, mm -hmm. seven times more likely to be interacting with 911. So we need, you know, train, app appropriately trained personnel and in, in, the, in, the, in the center, giving information to what is, what is the, you know, the best uh, uh, police and fire departments in the country are, are here in, in Massachusetts. And when something goes wrong, you're going to hit 911 on your phone, and somebody's going to be there, and they're going to save you. And if you have somebody with a disability and you're more likely, you're going to be in a better position. And that's, so I'm not afraid of this, you know, a way forward, or, or I'm not, you know, I don't have a, a reaction against you know the taxes or whatever it's not about being afraid to do something I would be more than willing to say this is something that it is good as somebody who spends every day um, in immersed in government mm -hmm. you know you pay me to do that job to go through that budget and take a look at things and find some things that may be onerous or maybe a great idea on paper that you know generations from now will be a problem so I have no problem doing that and uh, I didn't you know it, I sometimes Certain groups are saying, well, you take a no new tax pledge or you take this. I said, look, I'm, I'm, I figure a person's only good for one oath. And I made my, I, g I gave mine to the, to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when I get sworn in. So I'm not, you know, I'm not working for an interest group. I'm trying to work as best I can for my 165,000 people. And, and I, I, as part of this show or anywhere I go, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking for feedback. And, um, and I'm looking and I want to see how it, how it works from your household, from your neighborhood, or from your, from your town. And, you know, let's work together and make it better. I'm always impressed by the, uh, the uh, ability that you bring to your office and, and the intelligent, pragmatic approach you take when approaching things. And quite frankly, your passion is, is wonderful to see. And I am so sorry, but we are completely out of time. I want to thank you, Senator Timothy, for coming in, spending a little bit of time, sharing with us the current budget process. I do hope you'll come back again maybe later on, maybe after the budget has passed. Absolutely. I know you're very busy. No, I'd be happy to. I'll go local. I know you're wicked busy uh, up there um, working on our behalf. And thank you so much for all that you're doing. Sorry about the filibuster. Uh, you know what? <laughs> you're good at it. And, and frankly, uh, we'd rather hear you and what you have to say than anything that I can come up with. So thank you again for coming. And Senator James Timothy, if they want to get in touch with you directly, your email address is? It's uh, james.timothy at masenate.gov. I know that changed a little bit, so yep. people should update their email address. Mass.gov. Go look for the legislature page, and then you can look for the relatively scary picture uh, <laughs> when you get down to the T's. And that's me. Just send me an email or, uh, or, or, or call. At? 617-722-1222. Uh, Excellent. Thank you so much. And for all of you at home, thank you for taking a half hour. It's been with me, my guest, Senator James Timothy, representing us well up on Beacon Hill. If you would like to see this episode again, feel free to log into our website at www.fcatv.org. Or come by our studios at 28 Central Street and request a copy. We'll be happy to dub one for you for a small nominal charge. Our telephone number here at the studio is 508-543-4757. If you or your organization would like to be featured on a future episode of Foxborough Central, give us a shout and let us know. We'll be talking about you. Until then, have a great day, Foxborough.